The modern conception about history is that humanity is evolving, coming from the caveman to the industrial revolution. However, our understanding about the past is limited. The oldest artifacts that can be accepted as recorded history date from about 5,000 years ago. Most of the theories about what happened before that are based on just stones and bones. Many cultures from the past had a conception of a forgotten golden age. The Greeks, for example, believed that a humanity went through a sequence of four ages before the present times. In the first, the golden age, humans lived almost like gods, living a long and opulent life without having to work and never experiencing suffering. In the next age, called the Silver Age, humans become vastly inferior in appearance and wisdom and had to work to make a living. However, they still lived very long lives, with children playing for 100 years before growing up. In the third and fourth ages, called the Bronze Age and the Age of Heroes, men were strong and warlike and had shorter lives. Greeks believed to live in the last age of the cycle, a narrow age where humans are evil and selfish, burdened with weariness and sorrow. According to them, in this age, piety and other virtues disappeared and the gods abandoned earth. In the Vedas, the Greeks are described as the Pulindas, people close to Vedic culture, that although not a direct part of it, shared much of its values and knowledge. It's not a wonder thus that the concept of golden, silver, bronze and iron ages of the Greeks is also described in the Vedas, but in this case with more detail. According to the Vedas, our planet goes through a sequence of four ages, just like we have four seasons in a year and these seasons repeat, similarly these cosmic cycles also go on cyclically. Different from modern theories that conclude that modern human beings are the result of a long evolutive process that ultimately happened by chance, the Vedas explain that modern humans are actually fruit of a devolutive process. Humanity is originally created by higher beings in a state close to perfection and slowly degrades up to a point of complete barbarism. Dr. Michael Cremo explained this version in his book Human Devolution. According to the Vedas, the first of the four ages is called Satya Yuga, the Golden Age. That's the age of purity, where enlightened souls chalking up an ascending path towards higher planetary systems take birth in this planet to practice self-realization. In Satya Yuga, humans live almost like the inhabitants of higher planetary systems. They live in a subtle dimension and have bodies that are free of diseases. Through the practice of meditation, they are able to extend their lives and thus most are capable of living for incredible 100,000 years. At this age, all necessities of human beings are supplied by nature. Nobody has to work in farms or factories to make a living. By living such natural and pure lives, people of this age are completely free of anxiety and are thus capable of reaching spiritual perfection through the practice of Ashtanga Yoga. Such a yoga lasts for 4,000 celestial years. Each celestial year corresponds to 360 years of our time, and therefore such a yoga lasts for a total of 1,728,000 years. During this period, there is a gradual decline in the level of consciousness, which in time leads humanity to the second age in the cycle, Treta Yuga, or the Silver Age. In this period, people become interested in economic development. Agriculture becomes very prominent, and society is divided in different classes, with pious kings watching over the well-being of the general population. Most people in this age are still quite pious, and their level of consciousness is sufficient to award them bodies capable of living up to 10,000 years. The preferred method of self-realization in this age are elaborated ceremonies where Vedic mantras are chanted in perfect metric and cadence. Treta Yuga lasts for 3,000 celestial years, or 1,296,000 years of our time. Again, there is a gradual deterioration of collective consciousness, and slowly bad habits and lower qualities become more prominent, leading humanity to the third age, Dwapara Yuga, or the Bronze Age. In this age, about half of humanity is dominated by lust, greed, and other bad qualities. At the start of Dwapara Yuga, people live for 1,000 years, 
but life expectancy diminishes gradually and by the end of the period it's close to 100 years. There is also an acute division between groups that continue to follow the path of piety and spirituality and groups that succumb to the influence of lower qualities and therefore wars become frequent. Still, wars at this period were conducted in a chivalrous way where warriors would fight one-on-one -on -one following certain rules until one side would surrender. Typically, the two sides would previously agree on a certain place and the battles would happen away from the general population. We can see that this martial code was still followed to a certain extent in ancient Greece and more recently in Japan amongst the samurai. The Battle of Kurukshetra that took place right after the Bhagavad Gita happened in the final years of Dwapara Yuga, events that are described in detail in the Mahabharata. We can see how at those times there was a strong polarization around the virtuous Pandavas and the impious Kauravas, and that the group that supported the Kauravas was much bigger. The Pandavas managed to assemble seven divisions of soldiers in their army, while the Kauravas amassed eleven divisions. Things became better for some time under the rule of the Pandavas, followed by Parikshit Maharaj, but after that things started to become a little darker. Vapara Yuga lasts for 2000 celestial years, or 864,000 years of our time. It's followed by Kali Yuga, the last era of the cycle, the era we are currently living. This age started 5,121 years ago exactly at the time Krishna left this world. In the Surya Siddhanta is described a particular alignment of planets, very inauspicious according to astrology, that happens at the start of this era, an information confirmed by modern calculations. There is a great shift in consciousness after the end of Dwapara Yuga. With the beginning of Kali Yuga, humanity descends to a gross dimension, where we don't have contact with higher beings, during this age, our planet is basically quarantined. This idea explains why we can't find much evidence of evolved civilizations from the past. These were evolved humans who were living in a subtle dimension, to which we don't have access in our time. As a result, when we dig the ground, we find only bones and stone artifacts from aboriginal humans that were living in the same gross dimension as ourselves. During Kali Yuga, humanity slowly degrades, as beings from the lower realms get the opportunity of taking birth in our planet to accumulate a new set of karma. This is also the shortest of the four eras, lasting for just 1000 celestial years, or 432,000 years of our time. In the beginning of this age, people live for about 100 years, but just as before, the life expectancy gradually diminishes as time goes on. As people from this age have short lifespans and are not capable of concentrating for long periods, the recommended process for self-realization is the path of Bhakti Yoga, and especially the process of Sankirtana, coming together to chant mantras and thus connect ourselves with the Divine. As Kali Yuga progresses, good qualities such as truthfulness, self-control, simplicity, non-violence, freedom from anger, tranquility, compassion, gentleness and forgiveness gradually decreases, and bad qualities such as lust, anger, greed, illusion and enviousness increase, creating a difficult condition, especially for persons trying to follow a spiritually progressive path. As Kali Yuga progresses, humanity degrades to such an extent that people gradually lose their humanity and descend into complete barbarism. It's described in the Bhagavad Purana that by the end of Kali Yuga, the planet's ecosystem will be polluted and destroyed to such an extent that agriculture will become impossible. Animals will become much smaller and people will live for no more than 20 years. People will live mainly on meat and cannibalism will be rampant. People will have to work very hard to get just a few morsels of food. Moral principles will completely disappear and people will be prepared to torture and kill for their slightest gain. It's narrated that by the end of this period, the Avatar Akalki comes, annihilating the oppressive kings and soldiers that by the time will be no more than plunderers of the poor citizens he creates the conditions for the beginning of a new golden age. Under the guidance of superior beings, 
humanity is restored to its original state and a new Satya Yuga starts, making the beginning of a new cycle. However, there is also hope. It's also described that after the first 5000 years of Kali Yuga, a short golden age will manifest, offering the conditions for a gradual revival of spirituality, combined with growing material prosperity. In the next videos of this series, we are going to see more details about this golden age, as well as the longer cosmic cycles that the universe goes through. See you there! In the previous video, we studied about the cycles of four eras explained in the Vedas, as well as the progression of events in Kali Yuga, the age we live in. Kali Yuga lasts for 432,000 years, from which only 5,121 years have passed. In other words, there is still a long way to go. By studying recent history, we can see that Kali Yuga is not a very bright period for humanity, with constant wars, privation, and examples of inhuman cruelty. According to the Vedas, all of this happens as a predicted cosmic cycle of events, which is connected with the spiritual level of the souls allowed to take birth in our planet in each part of the cycle. Being a part of the intermediate planetary system, our planet is a place where souls from all over the cosmos come to perform activities, make their choices and thus create a new set of karma that is going to determine their future destinations. In this sense, we can imagine our planet as a universal airport, where people can decide where to go next. Souls that perform pious activities take their next birth in the higher planets, where they can have association of evolved beings and thus get the chance of progressing further, while souls that cultivate bad habits and commit violence to others go to the lower planets, where they take birth among similarly inclined souls. Similarly, souls take birth at one of the four ages according to their previous karma and their level of consciousness. In such a yuga, only highly elevated souls can take birth in this planet, and therefore the spiritual level is quite high. The entrance barrier is progressively lower on Treta and Dwapara Yuga, and thus the spiritual level of the society is similarly lesser. In Kali Yuga, there is practically no entrance barrier, and therefore we have all kinds of problems. Since our situation in this age is so complicated, there is also great opportunity for spiritual advancement through the process of Bhakti Yoga and especially through the performance of Sankirtana. By chanting mantras, one has the opportunity of direct connecting himself to the spiritual energy and thus make quick advancement. What will take thousands of years of practice of Ashtanga Yoga in Satya Yoga to achieve can be quickly obtained in our age. This opportunity makes this era actually quite fortunate to the extent that kings from higher planetary systems desire to take birth in our planet during this age. It's exactly this possibility of quick spiritual progression, combined with the presence of souls coming from higher realms that leads to the predictions of a golden age in the midst of our modern age. A glimmer of hope for the ones that are not interested in experiencing the rigors of the later stages of this age. In the Brahma Vaivarta Purana, it's predicted that the first 5000 years of Kali Yuga would be a period of darkness. Studying history, we can see that it was indeed so, with the Dark Ages, slavery, wars, and so on. Fortunately, this period is passing. Now we are in the second part of the predictions. The Brahma Vaivarta Purana states that after this period, an age of spiritual progress will issue. During half of this period, the river Ganges will be present alongside temples and the study of the sacred scriptures, and in the second half, spiritual knowledge will be propagated by enlightened spiritual teachers roaming the planet. Similarly, the Bhavisha Purana states that persons born in the western countries will practice this spiritual knowledge, becoming Brahmanas by initiation and qualification, and will propagate this knowledge around the world. By their efforts, humanity will change in a course of just a few generations, leading to an ascending period of spiritual prosperity. The conditions for this golden age were set by the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the 15th century. 
Although geographically limited to India, the spiritual movement started by him created the conditions for this gradual shift. Just as other Acharyas that lived in the past centuries, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakura made a few predictions about the appearance of this golden age. In fact, most of them already materialized, like the one that the Sankirtan movement of Mahaprabhu would spread in the Western countries, and English, French, Russian, German, and American people will join forces to push it further forward. Another prophecy is that a magnificent temple built in Mayapur, West Bengal, the birth site of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, would be a milestone in the appearance of this golden age, serving as a catalyst for the growing spiritual wave. This temple, the TOVP, is going to be inaugurated in 2022, so we may see some expressive changes still in our lifetimes. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, it's mentioned how enlightened souls that lived in other eras, as well as inhabitants of higher planetary systems, take advantage of the opportunity to take birth in this planet and thus conclude their spiritual practice and ascend to the transcendental realm. While here, they act as enlightened teachers, helping the rest of humanity to reach the same higher goal. This combination of people from this age that attain enlightenment through spiritual practice and elevated souls from previous eras and higher planetary systems has the potential to gradually turn the tide of materialism, leading to a revival of spiritual values, combined with growing material prosperity. This is a trend that tends to continue for some time as the golden age takes hold, a global spiritual awakening that can lead to a very fortunate period. It may seem hard to believe, but sometimes global changes can happen quite fast. Who could predict, in 1970, that in 50 years 11% of the United States would be vegetarian or vegan and that a global network would connect the whole world population? This process of gradual spiritual growth will continue until most of humanity will become spiritually advanced. The progression may not be linear, there may be periods with difficulties or even a few global catastrophes, but the general tendency during this period will be of improvement. As these fortunate souls conclude their spiritual advancement and move towards the transcendental realm or the higher planetary systems, the percentage of the population not interested in spiritual cultivation will again gradually increase, leading to a descending period. You can imagine this in the form of two lines in a graph. In the ascending period, the line representing spiritually advanced people slowly increases, while the line representing materialistic people gradually declines. This continues until most people become spiritually advanced, leading to the blossoming years of the Golden Age. However, as these souls leave the planet, going towards higher realms, new souls take birth here and thus the percentage of materialists start to increase again, leading to a descending period, where the spiritual level of society will slowly decay over a course of a few thousand years. Again, people will gradually become materialistic and hedonistic, and humanity will slowly degrade, both culturally and spiritually. People will become angry and cruel, and life will again become difficult and full of anxieties. As the last advanced souls leave the planet, the stage will be set for the remaining 417,000 years of Kali Yuga, which will not be a very good period to be born into. However, instead of being concerned about the dark times ahead, the best for us is to dedicate our time for cultivating self-realization now. The events of Kali Yuga take place because many adopt a selfish and exploitative nature, polluting and exploiting the natural resources as well as fellow human beings, and thus gradually have to face the karmic consequences. By following a different path, we become eligible for taking our next birth in higher planetary systems, creating a much brighter future for ourselves. Part of it is to also enlighten others, so they can also make better choices. In the next video, we will learn about the longer cosmic cycles the universe goes through, like the Manvantaras and Kalpas. How old is our universe and for how long it's going to last? Will it end in a big freeze or a big crunch like some theorize? See you there!
past videos, we studied about the cycles of four eras that affect our planet. The cycles of Satya Yuga, Treta Yuga, Dwapara Yuga and Kali Yuga go on cyclically, like the seasons of the year. Each complete cycle of four eras is called Chatu Yuga or Diva Yuga, and it lasts for a total of 12,000 celestial years, or 4.32 million years of our time. It may seem like a very long period, but it's actually just a moment in the cosmic scale of time. It's described, for example, that the inhabitants of Intraloka, one of the celestial planets of Swarga Loka, live for 10,000 celestial years. From there, we can see that not only the living standard, but also the perception of time in different planets of the cosmos differ. What's almost a complete universal cycle for us, it's just a lifetime for such higher beings. The cycle that affects the inhabitants of the higher planetary systems more directly is the Manvantara. To understand this next cycle, we need to understand how our universe is managed. Although the modern understanding is that everything works by just the combination of physical laws, the Vedas explain that the different forces that control the universe are under the supervision of higher beings called Devas, like Indra, Surya, Vayu, etc. Although the term Deva is usually translated as demigod, the Devas are also mortal beings, like you and me. It's just that because of their qualification, they receive positions of trust where they become responsible for controlling the forces of nature. Their positions can be compared with those of ministers, that although regular human beings receive the power and responsibility of looking over certain aspects of the state. The names attributed to them are actually posts that are occupied at different times by different personalities. The current Indra, for example, is called Purandra, and the next will be Bali. A Manvantara is composed of 71 Chatur Yugas, and lasts for a total of 852,000 celestial years, or 306,720 million years of our time. The events at the end of a Manvantara are much more dramatic than the events at the end of a Kali Yuga, resonating all over the cosmos. All the devas led by Manu, who jointly control the forces of nature and maintain the universe in balance, live for a period of a single Manvantara. When the period is concluded, they pass away and a new generation of superior beings has to take their places. During this time, there are many disturbances in the universe and it takes some time until things get back on track. During this period, life in our planet ceases almost completely and everything starts again with the advent of a new Manu, who receives the mission of repopulating the universe with all the different species of life. This period of transition is called Sanja, and it lasts for 1.728 million years. The next cosmic cycle is called a Kalpa, and it lasts for a total of 4.32 billion years. At the end of this period, the planets and other structures of the universe are completely destroyed, and only the material elements remain. There is then an equally long period of darkness, and finally the cycle of creation and destruction repeats. The Kalpa cycles correspond to the days and nights of Brahma, the universal architect. During the 4.32 billion years of his day, the different cycles of the universe goes on, and the universe remains dormant during the 4.32 billion years of his night. Although very powerful, Brahma is a living being, just like us. However, due to his great qualification, he receives the responsibility of administering the universe, just like a king or president. It may look like a prestigious position, but it's actually a quite difficult job. Most of us already have trouble maintaining a small family with a few children. Imagine having the whole universe depending on you. It's narrated, for example, that a few cycles ago, Brahma fell asleep during one of his days, which triggered a partial devastation of the universe. This led to the appearance of Mach Avatara, who saved Manu and other beings from destruction. There was thus a happy end, but it illustrates how things can go wrong on Brahma's slightest inattentiveness. When a universe is destroyed, all the souls that take part of it enter into a state of deep sleep. Just like we have to sleep at the end of a busy day, everyone has to sleep during this period. It's just that this slumber lasts much longer. 
When Brahma finally wakes up, he has to recreate the universe from the material elements left from the previous cycle, allowing all the souls to get new bodies and start again their activities from where they stopped last time. The cycle of creation happens during a period of 1.728 million years in the beginning of each Kalpa. During this period, Brahma has to recreate all the planets as well as to repopulate the universe, starting from the most elevated beings. One personality that has a pivotal role in this is Manu, who is in charge of creating the first representatives of each species in each planet, as well as supervising the universal affairs. Just like in the case of the Devas, Manu is not a name but a pose that is occupied by different personalities at different times. As mentioned, Manu works in cooperation with the demigods to maintain the order of the cosmos. Each team of a Manu and different demigods live for a Manvantara, and there is a succession of 14 different teams during a Kalpa. If you try to do the calculation, the numbers will at first not add up. Each Manvantara corresponds to 71 Chatur Yuga, and thus 14 Manvantaras correspond to just 994 Chatur Yugas, instead of 1000. This difference corresponds to the durations of the initial creation, as well as the Sanjas in the end of each Manvantara. We can say that each Manvantara includes 71 complete cycles of Chatur Yugas, and there are a few other fragments left over corresponding to the Sanjas. Including these fragments, the numbers adds up to exactly 4.32 billion years. According to the Vedas, we are in the 28th Chatur Yuga of the 70 Manvantara of the current day of Brahma. In other words, we are close to the middle of his day. We can thus calculate that the universe already went through almost 1.973 billion years of this particular cycle of creation, which means there is 2.347 billion years to go, quite a long time. One cold question how the Vedas can affirm that this particular universe we live on can be only 1.973 billion years old, at least in this particular iteration, since modern studies point that the universe is much older, based on measurements of the distances and radial velocities of the galaxies. The problem with this estimative is that it's based on the idea that the current distance and motion of the galaxies started with the Big Bang, when one accepts that the universe was created and put in motion by superior forces, this calculation loses its validity, because the original position is unknown. Similarly, the age of our planet is estimated in 4.54 billion years by modern researchers, based on radiometric dating. The problem is that this process assumes that the material elements were formed at a certain time. It's believed that most uranium was formed in supernovae, for example, and the process of decay of radioactive elements started from there. If one accepts the Vedic version that our planet was created alongside the rest of the universe by a superior force from material elements that already existed previously, the calculation loses its validity. Therefore, instead of speculating based on insufficient evidence, one can just trust the information given in the Vedas, just like one can discover who is his father by asking his mother. In any case, these 1.973 billion years are nothing compared to the total age of the universe. According to the Vedas, we are in the first day of the 51st year of the life of Brahma. This means that our Brahma already lived half of his life, which means the universe already went through 18,000 cycles of creation and destruction. In total, our universe is more than 155 trillion years old. Mind-boggling, huh? Brahma lives for a total of 311.04 trillion years, an extremely long period of time. During this period, the universe goes through 36,000 cycles of creation and destruction, corresponding to the passage of his days and nights. After this period, Brahma finally reaches the end of his life. With his death, the universe is completely destroyed. However, this is also not the end. After an equally long period, the universe is created again by Mahavishnu. There is a new Brahma and a new cycle of 311.04 trillion years starts. Again, all the different cycles repeat. 
That's actually the secret behind these detailed descriptions about the future offered in the Vedas. Timing our plane works in a circular way, with the same general events repeating cyclically. Just like a theatrical performance that is staged again and again with the same script but different actors. The higher beings that transmitted this knowledge are able to see the circular nature of time and they share this knowledge with us in the form of the Vedas, so we can understand how the cycles work and make the best out of it. We tend to think that our everyday events are so important, but they are actually just an imperceptible blip in the vast scale of universal affairs.